Hey Beaks, today we're going to wrap up our discussion on the immune system and talk about disruptions to immunity. Okay, here we go. So disruptions in immune system function can elicit or exacerbate disease. So in other words, it can bring about a disease or it can make a disease much worse when your immune system isn't working the way it should. Some pathogens have evolved to diminish the effectiveness of host immune responses. So basically what we're talking about here is there's an evolutionary arms race right? Your immune system has been evolving for millions of years to fight all these different pathogens out there. But the pathogens have also been evolving for millions of years to try and combat our immune system, right? So it's an arms race and uh, it's ongoing. And sometimes your immune system is just exaggerated, self-directed. Sometimes you have diminished responses and all of these can ruin the delicate balance that exists right? And this could cause very little problem throughout your day, or it can be fatal depending on what the uh, perturbing of the immune system is. And one exaggerated response that a lot of you deal with is allergies, right? This is just a hypersensitive response to antigens, which are called allergens. Now, the problem is, as you know, many of you are very well aware, these allergens aren't really harmful right? There's nothing to the allergen that really should make you, your immune system trigger and fight this battle when there's really no reason to fight. But because our immune system got tricked into fighting, we elicit this huge immune response. And uh, that leads to all the problems that go along with allergies. And you might think like, okay, here we're saying about IgE antibodies, right? With mast cells that can degranulate and cause all those symptoms that you get with hay fever. Sure. And that you can deal with, it's a pain in the butt, you know, but what about like a bee sting, for example? Okay, that, that could lead to, to someone dying potentially, and it's all just because your immune system doesn't realize, hey, cool your jets a little bit. This isn't really all that dangerous, but because you start this war, sure, it can lead to a lot of problems. So let's uh, take a look at a little bit more about allergies. Get your tissues ready because spring has sprung. Hey guys, Terry here for D News, and it is officially that time of year. The birds are chirping, the flowers are blooming, and if you're anything like me, your nose is a disgusting faucet of never-ending liquids. But before you go blaming pollen for those pesky seasonal allergies, remember, you have no one to blame but yourself. So what's happening inside your body when you experience allergies? Well, in short, it's basically one giant misunderstanding. The first time you're exposed to an allergen, your immune system investigates that allergen and produces specific antibodies for it, which are special cells designed to detect and stop foreign invasion. Typically, this is a good thing. It's what prevents you from getting sick. But in the case of allergies, your immune system mistakes innocuous things like pollen or cat dander for a serious threat. And in response to that threat, your plasma cells release a flood of these antibodies that attach to the surface of your mast cells, causing them to burst open and release a flood of histamine. Histamine is what causes the swelling that leads to various allergy-like symptoms, like runny nose, sneezing, or hives. But why do some people have such bad allergies and others none at all? There's no cut and dry answer to that question, but genetics and environment seem to play the two biggest roles. Research, for example, has shown that children with one allergic parent have a 33% chance of developing allergies. And with two allergic parents, that number goes up to 70%. Genetics are also the reason African-American children experience three times as much sensitivity to food allergens as Caucasian children. In science, we're always taught that early development is the most crucial stage of life, and early exposure to allergens is also no different. Research from Henry Ford Hospital shows that having a pet in the house during your child's first year of life may protect him or her from developing allergies. That same group also found that babies born via C-section were six times more likely to be sensitive to dust mite allergens than babies born via natural birth, presumably because they're not exposed to the microbiome of bacteria present in the mother's birth canal, which teaches their immune system the difference between good and bad bacteria. This goes hand in hand with something called the hygiene hypothesis, which aims to explain why allergies are more prevalent in wealthy industrialized nations than developing countries. Again, the idea is that a lack of early exposure to parasites and bacteria typically found in developing nations 
prevents our bodies from being able to develop the appropriate immune response. So in the event we're actually exposed to dangerous agents, our bodies simply don't know how to deal with it. So what can we do about seasonal allergies if our bodies just refuse to cooperate? Antihistamines can alleviate the symptoms, but they're not going to make you any less allergic to something you're already allergic to. Some studies tout alternative remedies like acupuncture or eating locally grown honey, but most of those have anecdotal effects. The only proven treatment for respiratory allergies is immunotherapy, where you receive increasing doses of whatever allergen you're sensitive to, either orally or via injection. That slow buildup of allergens allows your body to acclimate to them, which in turn improves your long-term tolerance. Not only is this an expensive option if you don't have insurance, it's also a time-consuming process that can take months or even years. In the most extreme cases, people with severe allergies can resort to rush immunotherapy, which is the same thing, but done on a much tighter timeline. So instead of spreading out your doses over several months or years, you receive all of them in a week. One long, miserable, never-ending week. Still better than a lifetime of sneezing, though, that much I can tell you. I got tested for allergies my first year of college and discovered I was allergic to all 71 allergens they tested me for, including both American and German cockroaches. So, yeah, I'm pretty worldly. I know there's weirder stuff out there, though, so let us know what you're allergic to in the comments down below or hit us up on Twitter at DNews. Okay, so I feel very lucky I don't have to deal with that, but... These IgE antibodies produced, then like we said on the first exposure, they're going to attach to mast cells. But then the next time that the allergen, right, enters the body, it binds to the mast cell associated IgE molecules, right? So these little antibodies is immunoglobulin class E molecules. And the mast cells are then going to degranulate. They release their histamine and other mediators that cause vascular changes leading to your allergy symptoms. Okay, but like we said, sometimes it could be much worse than that. So an acute allergic response can lead to anaphylactic shock, a life-threatening reaction within seconds of allergen exposure, right? And that's why it's very important to understand your allergies and you see kids walking around school, right? And you have to understand what their allergies are just in case some uh, drastic thing like this happens. I do, do want to highlight everyone what happens during an anaphylactic reaction because there is a difference between just a, a localized allergen or allergic reaction and true anaphylactic shock. This word is key because your body literally goes into shock when you have one of these reactions. Now it can happen with foods, medications, it can also happen with insect stings, with a bee sting for instance. Because what happens is when you're exposed to this allergen, whichever one it may or may not be, your body responds to it. This allergen, your body recognizes it as a foreign invader. It attaches to these antibodies, and what happens is these mast cells degranulate all this histamine. Now, if that histamine is just local, you might get a little local reaction. You might get a little bit of hives on your skin. But unfortunately, what can happen when it comes to anaphylaxis is within minutes of exposure to an allergen, food allergies, for instance, an anaphylactic reaction can occur where you get swelling of the mouth, swelling of the tongue and lips called angioedema. You can actually get constriction of your airways, making breathing more difficult. Your airways may constrict, but what happens is your blood vessels may dilate, and you'll have a systemic drop in your blood pressure. As all these things happen together, if you do not respond, you can die. And I'm not talking die in hours. I'm talking within 10 minutes, if proper treatment is not given, someone can die. Now, what we have, luckily, is something called an EpiPen. This can be truly life-saving. This staves off what we call circulatory collapse. I want everyone to look at this label very closely. All you have to do is read. It's, it's quite simple. You're going to pull off the, the safety release, okay? And then you want to put it into a bigger muscle. So the thigh tends to be a very good spot for that. And literally, you're just going to auto-inject into the thigh. Hold it for 10 seconds. And then you're going to want to call 911 and get help. Because without this, and I have to ask the two of you, I'm assuming that your friends, you've taught your friends how to use this? Yeah, most of my friends know how to use it. Because what you're going to see is if your friend, if, it's, you know, if your friend has anaphylaxis, they're going to have potentially difficulty breathing. You're going to see potential swelling of the lips and tongue. But if they look in extremis like that 
that model over there, that's time. That's yeah. when it's time to grab the EpiPen. Well, thank you all so very much for joining us. Best of luck. All right, so allergies, not very fun to deal with. You also have autoimmune diseases, okay? And this is when the immune system loses tolerance for self and turns against certain molecules of the body. Remember we talked about earlier that one of the, the cool uh, like tenets of your immune system is that it has to learn self, right? And, and obey self tolerance. Because could you imagine this, this little, you know, military inside of you that's there looking for bad guys all day long to get rid of them. If they confuse you for the bad guys and start attacking you, it happens, right? That's called an autoimmune disorder. So these diseases include systemic lupus, erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, and multiple sclerosis. So how do we keep our immune system nice and healthy? Well, take a look here. Moderate exercise improves your immune system function, right? So being active every day, very, very important. Now, a lot of people, when, when I was going through school, they used to, oh, stress causes ulcers and stress causes, you know, all this stuff to happen, which is not necessarily true, but indirectly it is, right? Stress is very, very bad for your body, okay? And of course, there are little healthy stressors that you deal with throughout the day, but a lot of stress, psychological stress can actually inhibit how well your immune system works, okay? So this has been shown to disrupt immune system regulation by altering the interactions of the hormonal, nervous, and immune systems. Sufficient rest, and you can see a cute puppy there, right? It's also important for immunity. So you have to make sure that you get plenty of sleep as your body needs rest. There are some other things that can happen with your immune system too, such as immunodeficiency diseases, right? And these inborn immunodeficiency diseases, these result from hereditary, right? Or develop, developmental defects that prevent proper functioning of innate humoral and or cell mediated defenses. So obviously, if you're born with a condition that interferes with the correct functioning of your immune system, you're in big trouble, right? And you have to be very careful. And it's not all that uncommon for this to happen. Acquired immunodeficiency develops later in life and results from exposure to chemical and biological agents, right? So in other words, you're not born with it, but it can happen. And one way that that can happen is when you get AIDS, right? Or if, gosh forbid, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS is caused by a virus, HIV. Okay, and obviously there's a lot of information out there now, and, and thankfully we're, we're making huge strides for combating that virus, but it's very important. Education, super, super important when dealing with the HIV virus. Okay, so like I said, there's things out there that are helping the pathogens avoid our immune system, right? And they've been evolving as long as we have, right? So pathogens have evolved mechanisms to thwart immune responses. Right? So Charles Darwin was mainly concerned with uh, bigger organisms, but if he knew about all this microbiome out there, he would have been very interested to see this. So you have antigenic variation, right? So through this antigenic variation, some pathogens are able to change epitope expression and prevent recognition, right? So once your immune system realizes, hey, you're the bad guy right there, okay, and we start to attack it, some pathogens can just change their, their epitopes, change that antigen a little bit, and what happens is now our immune system would have to learn all over again who to fight, right? And a good example of this is the flu, right? The human influenza virus mutates rapidly, and that's why every year we need a better, newer flu vaccine, because a lot of times it changes to something that we're not quite ready to fight. Now, as I'm recording this, we're dealing with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, right? And that's largely because of Human viruses occasionally exchange genes with viruses of domesticated animals, okay, or maybe even not domesticated, and this poses a danger as human immune systems are unable to recognize the new viral strain. Okay, now as of right now, this is, I'm recording this in the beginning of June of 2020, we still don't exactly know how this novel coronavirus came about, right? Some people are saying it was a bat or a pangolin or, or something from like a, a meat market there in China or this uh, wild animal market. Some people are even saying it could be from a lab over there, which is seems unlikely. But point is, we don't have any immunity to it. This, this virus is novel, okay? And this does happen. You might think like, oh, this is the craziest thing, right? Because for example, one of the reasons I'm recording this video right now is because we can't be in school, right? Because this pandemic hit us hard and fast. 
but this happens, right? You can see here we have the H1N1, the swine flu, or the H5N1, the avian flu. These things are, are around regularly, and uh, hopefully we don't get hit with something so major that it whacks us and takes out the majority of our population, but that's very possible, right? Because your immune system isn't ready for these, you know, emerging viruses. We have to be very careful, and that's why it's amazing that these uh, scientists, I just read this morning how there's uh, hundreds of vaccines currently in trial, all right? So again, we're putting our faith into these scientists, which we should, who are working so hard to keep us all safe. Pretty neat, maybe that'll be some of you someday. Here you can see uh, trypanosomiasis, right? So this uh, there's a parasite that causes something called African sleeping sickness. And it's kind of sad, you could research that more if you want to, but, um, it, it escapes our immune response because as you can see here, there's variants of it, right? So here's variant one. And once you learn how to fight it, we're going to create a whole bunch of antibodies. Sure, variant one dies off slowly, but then as it changes the antigens, psh, that takes off and then that takes off. So you can see here that, man, oh man, you could be battling this thing for a very, very, very long time, all because of antigenic variation. All right. Another thing that makes viruses hard to treat um, is something I talked to you about before. If you watched my last video where I was talking about like chicken pox parties and things like that, latency. Some viruses can actually remain in a host in an inactive state called latency. Okay, and they don't always exist as a viral particle, but sometimes they do. Herpes simplex viruses can be present in a human host without causing any symptoms. So herpes can lay there and all of a sudden, for example, in your nerve cells, they can get triggered probably because of some sort of stress and what that does is it reactivates the virus and now you have to deal with it again, right? So it's almost like a, a little sleeping enemy inside your cells. Very scary, but there are a lot of new treatments becoming available to deal with this. And this brings us to the cycles of these uh, viruses. So here you can see the lytic versus the lysogenic cycle of a phage, right? The bacteria phage, these viruses only infect bacteria, but during the lytic cycle, as you can see, the, uh, the DNA, of course, gets injected, right? And then the lytic cycle is induced. You're gonna make new phages, right? And the cell is gonna lyse and they're gonna get released and no good, right? That cell's gonna die and now all these new phages are gonna go and keep this going and going and going. But you also have something called the lysogenic cycle over here, okay? So once a cell gets infected, okay, with this genome right here from the virus, what can happen is you can create this prophage here. So the phage DNA actually becomes part of the bacterial chromosome and it's going to stay there, right? So point is you're now copying the viral DNA and it's not necessarily in this cycle right now where it's creating new viruses and, and you know, ruining your cell or killing the cell, but eventually, yeah, it might. Okay, so lytic versus lysogenic cycle. All right, and like I mentioned before, the, the knowledge we now have about HIV is, is awesome compared to what it used to be. Um, I was born actually in 1980, and I was too young to realize what was going on. But when HIV hit, when this thing hit the planet, and all these people started dying of crazy random infections that never have been seen before, people were very scared. As a matter of fact, depending on where you were in the world, you could be standing in a group of people and it's basically like every other person looking around the room was probably going to die of HIV, right? Or of AIDS, okay? So very scary stuff. Human immunodeficiency virus or HIV, okay? Infects helper T cells, oh, right? Now you've gone through acquired or adaptive immunity, you know how important these helper T cells are, right? Their activation is gonna tell everybody, hey, we need the humoral response with those antibodies, let's do it. We need the cell mediated response to go kill the cells that are infected, let's do it. Helper T cells are so important. So this virus attacking them, oh man, that's gonna really disrupt your immunity, right? It's gonna ruin your immune system in a lot of ways. So. It impairs these uh, responses and it eludes the immune system because of antigenic variation, right? And an ability to remain latent while integrated into host DNA. So you can see it's using a bunch of different tricks against us. And this is why a lot of times with these patients, it's not just taking like a drug, you know, against HIV, because what's gonna happen is sure, you change the environment, you made your insides toxic against that viral particle, but the thing is, once this antigenic variation happens or once HIV mutates, well, now it's gonna beat that drug and now it's gonna you know, erupt again. So a scientist 
generally found, okay, and this is going back quite a while now, okay, but hey, let's use a medley, let's use a cocktail of drugs, and, and as it starts to change, let's hit it with another drug, and as it changes again, hit it with a different drug, and just keep, keep, keep that viral load down, and it really uh, enhance people's lives that are dealing with this disease. HIV is covered by an envelope derived from a host cell membrane. Glycoproteins studying the envelope recognize and bind to receptor molecules on the host cell. A protein coat surrounds the viral genetic material, which consists of two molecules of single-stranded RNA. The enzyme reverse transcriptase enables the virus to make DNA from an RNA template, a trick for which this group of viruses is named, retroviruses. The RNA molecules of HIV enter a host cell when the virus fuses with the plasma membrane and the coat proteins are removed by enzymes. Reverse transcriptase catalyzes the synthesis of a DNA strand complementary to the viral RNA strand and then a second DNA strand complementary to the first. The double-stranded DNA is incorporated as a provirus into the host cell's chromosomal DNA where it may lie dormant for years. Occasionally, the provirus is transcribed into RNA. This RNA serves as both messenger RNA for the formation of HIV proteins and as genetic material for the next generation of viruses. Protein coats form around viral RNA and reverse transcriptase molecules. Viruses bud from the host cell, acquiring envelopes as they leave. So that's pretty crazy. This virus can use your own cell parts, right? As it's punching through your membrane and it takes the envelope from you, which is kind of nasty. Um, the other thing, if you notice there, we talked about, you know, when we did our, our DNA replication and then transcription and translation. Well, in this case, you insert RNA and RNA should be pretty short lived in a cell, right? Well, what happens is because it's a retrovirus, it uses reverse transcriptase. Remember, transcription is DNA to RNA. So reverse transcriptase goes RNA to DNA. This enzyme helps you go backwards or retrofit it right inside. And it becomes this provirus. And then what happens is that provirus might be there for a very long time or it might get started to get uh, transcribed right away and translated into HIV viruses, which eventually are going to really wreak havoc on your immune system. Right? Scary, scary stuff. These these uh, biological saboteurs, a lot of people call them. They're not even a living particle, right? Because they need you to reproduce, but they kill millions of people every single year. So people with AIDS are highly susceptible to what we call opportunistic pathogens or infections and cancers that take advantage of immune system collapse. Okay, and the spreading of HIV is certainly a worldwide problem. And again, the best approach for slowing it is education, right? So Obviously, you've learned about this throughout your, your uh, academic career so far, but, you know, protected sex and obviously drug abuse in all ways is wrong, but obviously sharing needles and things like that, uh, just super, super important to uh, help uh, quell the, the spread of this disease, right? Very scary stuff. And that's kind of why people got very freaked out about this, especially early on before we knew what was happening. Because think about it, you're getting hit with pathogens right now. There's probably fungal particles hitting you in the eye and there's bacteria possibly on your skin right now that can really cause lots of disease. Well, the thing is you have an immune system, so you're okay, right? The immune system is going to protect you against all this stuff that's happening all day long. Well, the problem with HIV was people started dying of, of AIDS, but we didn't know they were dying of all these infections that no one has ever seen before right? These new fungi that are killing people, these new bacterial infections that really shouldn't be able to take hold. People are thinking, what is happening here? And then they realized, oh, it's the type of stuff that we're always getting exposed to. It's just some of these people are immunocompromised, right? And their immune systems aren't ready to fight those bugs. And thus they die from it, right? When I say bugs, I mean pathogens. Okay. And one last thing here, like I said, I'm using a, an older textbook to uh, teach this class is a few years old now, but this has grown like crazy, right? We now know a whole lot more than we've ever known before about cancer and your immune system. And your immune system really does a good job of keeping cancer at bay and keeping it away, 
lots of different types of cancer anyway. And we're even now, like we talked about, we now know how to use your immune system to fight cancer. We can actually teach your immune system. And it used to be, not all that long ago, an individualized treatment where we teach one person's immune system to fight cancer. Okay, and, and some of you did some projects for me and things like that. You're talking about like CAR-T and all that stuff. It's awesome. But now we're getting to the point where we're starting to learn how to make a, a broad therapy against cancer that should work for basically everybody. So using your immune system, retraining your immune system to fight cancer growing inside your body. Just awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. Right. So. The frequency of certain cancers increases when adaptive immunity is impaired, of course. And about 20%-ish of all human cancers do involve viruses, which makes sense, right? Because cancer is not always heritable, but it's certainly genetic, right? Cancer deals with mutations of your DNA, and viruses goof up your DNA a lot of times, right? So the immune system can act as a defense against viruses that cause cancer and cancer cells that harbor viruses, right? Remember, we talked about those... Uh, killer T cells that travel around and they actually can find cancer and destroy it. Now, this is getting a little older now, but what a huge, you know, win for, for medicine, for science. In 2006, a vaccine was released that acts against human papillomavirus or HPV, and this virus is associated with cervical cancer. And if you want, you can uh, take a second and pause the video here and read a little bit more about this. Okay. Um, but this is wild, okay? So here you can see this uh, professor or Dr. Harold Zerhausen, who, you know, was being told, no, no, that, you know, give up on that, that's silly. But he's saying, no, I think certain strains of the HPV can cause cervical cancer. And I think by creating a vaccine against it, we can save a lot of lives. That's exactly what happened, right? So HPV is, is the most or one of the most commonly uh, spread STDs out there, right? Sexually transmitted diseases. So again, knowledge is power, right? Use your brains. And what he's saying is that, hey, I, I'm going to run these controlled experiments and show, and he did, and then these vaccines ended up saving so many people. And as we talked about in the last video, vaccines are so important. They're hugely important. So everybody should be vaccinated, including against this. And there's a lot of controversy about this, right? Which we can talk about with bioethics. But, you know, a lot of parents out there would say something like, who, who are a little skeptical of vaccines in the first place, hey, you know, well, that's okay because I'm just going to raise my child so that I wouldn't need protection against sexually transmitted diseases and things like that. Hey, it can never hurt, right? Developing immunity against this virus is very, very important. And why wouldn't you do it early just in case you are ever exposed to it, right? Super, super important. So here you can see that, um, boy, oh boy, lots and lots and lots of people are saved from the ravages of cervical cancer, okay, all because of a vaccine that was made. So your immune system, pretty awesome stuff, and teaching it how to fight these viruses early is just amazing. So anyway, that's just a little side background story there. If you're more interested in uh, Dr. Zerhausen, go onto the Nobel Prize page. There's some really cool videos on there where he talks about his research and, and what he did, and it's, it's really actually like, it's kind of moving, you know, it just makes you proud to be to be a human and watch what other people are doing for us. So anyway, I hope this was helpful. I hope the immune system and immune responses now make a little bit more sense to you than before we started this unit. And uh, hope everybody has a good day. Take care.